Hi, my name is Holly, and I'm a Cree and Scottish Métis woman in Alberta, Canada. In this series, I invite you to join me on my journey of reconnecting and learning about what it means to be Métis. This is Modern Métis Canada. The Métis people were always a festive people with a deep appreciation for song, combining their First Nations and European cultures into a new type of music. As the Europeans brought violins to Canada, the Métis people became familiar with the instrument and began playing First Nations, Scottish and French Canadian rhythms with uncommon sounds. The Métis people would gather and celebrate by holding a Red River Ball with many fiddlers and dancers. Fiddling within a Métis society was a common talent since both the rich and the poor enjoyed playing the instrument. Nearly every Métis family had a fiddle player. Fiddles were typically handmade from maple wood and birch since most Métis pet families could not afford the ones that were already made. Despite having no professional training, many Métis people became masters at playing the fiddle, some even playing for the Queen Mother of England. Métis fiddlers were considered cultural storytellers and ambassadors as they traveled throughout North America to take part in fiddling contests. The first recognized creator of Métis songs was Pierre Falcon. His songs The Battle of Seven Oaks or The Ballad of Frog Plain were sung by the Métis for at least three generations. His songs were passed down through oral tradition and as a result Many different versions of the song exist. The Métis people often sang songs to keep their spirits high during times of adversity. For example, the Métis often sang during the 1885 Northwest Resistance, and Louis Riel himself wrote a few songs called The Battlefield, or Riel's Farewell, which was written before his execution on November 16, 1885. In today's culture, the fiddle is still a common Métis instrument and music style, but the Métis have also adapted with popular culture to become musicians in genres like rock, hip-hop, country, and pop music. To get more information about music and what it means to be Métis, I sat down with two very different musicians, Ross Pambram, who's a musician in the band Memphis and the Grand, and Michael Broadfoot, who is also known as MC Good Medicine. So they could teach me about what their music means to them. I always introduce myself as uh, Michael Daniel Broadfoot. That's my given name, uh, and Daniel's my dad's first name. My uh, sacred name is Apis Gunaki, which means far shooter or shoots far, given to me by my elder Mexicum from Sixaga uh, of the Blackfoot Confederacy. And uh, my uh, hip hop name is MC Good Medicine because I believe words can be good medicine. That's why I'm here today. I use uh, she, her pronouns and uh, I'm two spirit. I'm an MC. Uh, I guess you could also say I'm a storyteller. I'm an artist. I am trying to my best to contribute to decolonizing things. Um, my ancestors, my biological ancestors, come from the Manitoba area. Uh, I'm uh, Métis on both sides of my family, and uh, on my biological family, and on my dad's side, uh, we're Cree as well. I'm down at the county fair With my girl at my side We're sitting outside of the chutes And the dusty old cowboy climbs up to ride He grimaces and tips his hat And the chute swings open wide When I started out, I was a nurse before I moved in to becoming a professional fire officer. But as time moved forward, 
I um, started to explore the idea of business and connection. But back when my dad, who was an Aboriginal veteran, and my mom, who was from Saskatchewan, I started to come to realize that my dad's little journey, um, when, he was, when he was finishing his career with the military, there was a disconnect when you were in the military between identity and this, your relationships. So all of a sudden, he started to really try and get an understanding. What was he culturally? Where was that coming from? Because his nickname was Half-Breed when he was in the, was in the military. So there was a, you know, an oddity. There, was, there wasn't a sense of racism, but it was a sense now he needed to understand where does the connection begin after that part of his journey finishes. So as a result of that, I realized if it was just as important to him at that time, it's going to be real important to me. So I started to pay a bit more attention to the things that he was involved with. Next thing you know, you start to realize that you're gathering more at some of the Métis events because it's a very celebratory culture. Métis kitchen parties, things are happening. And the more you get involved, the more of the social aspects you get involved, you really meet a lot of great people and you start to see spirit of culture about how people are getting together. And I started to enjoy that. As a result of that, Next thing you know, you're starting to do a bit of business within the aspect of the Métis culture, um, getting involved in the gatherings, getting involved in the celebrations, the festivals. And each time you take one more step in that journey, you're learning a little bit more about culture. You're starting to learn a little bit more about your family history and that identity. Um, next thing you know, I built my own little band called Memphis and the Grand. Now, the aspect of where Memphis came from was kind of a story between me and when I met my hero, Mr. B.B. King. I got invited backstage, and I was holding a Gibson ES-335 Semihog Body Cherry Red Dot Reissue 1985. And he looked at me and he said, well, what hand are you, son? I had to think about it a little bit because it was, I was almost confused. I said, well, right-handed guitar player. Well, that's important because he needs to know which way to sign your guitar. So we signed this beautiful guitar of mine. And it was shortly after that I was standing there looking at something else, and this guy says to me, he goes, Memphis. And I, I wasn't really paying attention, and, and standing beside a poster I had, and he says, Memphis. Around the third time, I look over and I said, sorry? And he goes, that picture you're holding there. He says, you got that in Memphis, Tennessee? I said, yeah. He says, you got that on a little poster shop on Beale Street, Memphis, Tennessee? I said, as a matter of fact, I did, sir. And he says, well, that picture that just B.B. King signed as well, that's $5,000. I said, well, it doesn't really matter how much it's going to be worth in the future because it's not going anywhere. But when I told that story to my band back then, a long time ago, they laughed and they said, Memphis. And you know, sometimes you're lucky when it sticks with you. And I've had a few people who say to me, you know, you can pull that off. And that's the most polite, generous compliment I've ever received is when somebody says that. When I built my business, it wasn't necessarily meant to be the Memphis group. That was just sort of a placeholder. But all of a sudden, I've developed a, a, a business where we do environmental satellite monitoring. We help try to protect communities. One of the real fun things that I'm working on right now is I'm doing some co-creation work with the province. But then there's another one where I'm doing some philanthropy for the Calgary Zoo and the Wilder Institute, where we're trying to come up with strategies on assisting species translocation of animals that are near extinction in Africa to ensure that where we may put them has viability for their habitat and the ecology to support them. Working for the fire department, satellite, but you know, heart and soul comes right from here when you're playing music and when you're playing in a band and you've got these friends behind you and you've got good country music and, and rock and roll that's kicking behind you, sure feels good. All the rest of the troubles in the world go away. I just get to see the smiles, and I get to see people dance. You know, when I was younger, uh, Christmas was a bit really big thing in my family, and, you know, didn't have any money, but I felt like I could write nice things to people, and so I would write these kind of like motivational notes for people trying to acknowledge them, to see their truth, to see them in a good light. You know, if I were to trace back my writing roots, that's where it comes from. But I, you know, I didn't go by, I wasn't connected to hip hop like I am today. Um, and honestly, I didn't even know who I was um, as an indigenous person. 
you know, and I think it's uncomfortable to, to know that I was disconnected from my culture, but at the same time, you know, the more that I'm meeting other Indigenous and Native people, like, it's, you know, there's a lot of us, you know, that have been disconnected from our culture, and that's a direct result of colonial policies, you know, of the Canadian state. And, you know, before I was really going by MC Good Medicine, I had thought about the name, and uh, I was pretty much just rapping in my basement alone, uh, but I would occasionally put uh, videos out on uh, my uh, Facebook page called the, uh, the Canvas Whiteboard, and uh, but that was pretty much it. And then um, I started getting connected with a group here in uh, Mokinstis, which is Calgary, uh, to do these ciphers. It was called Cipher Club. Uh, shout out Z the Free, who um, was running those those ciphers and you know freestyling you know we would be sitting in a group and you don't know you know what anybody's gonna say you know really you know and uh, so that was a big part of of feeling confident I think enough to start um, rapping in public more and seeing in public and uh, getting to know myself deeper um, in fact the first time that I ever used my words to come out of the closet was in a cipher during a freestyle and clearly it was like a like a pressure relief valve I guess because I needed to to have that and so so being a part of that cipher we started doing other things um, such as uh, I do a podcast uh, we're on break right now but it's called the Sweetie Treaty Show we started doing a, a cipher segment on there we got started getting connected with local artists community leaders and especially uh, local hip hoppers. And so getting to hear their story, you know, what their process is, what do they stand for, what do they talk about. Um, and there's a huge indigenous presence within the hip hop scene. You know, there's really something hip hop, you know, really helped uh, black and Latino folks liberate themselves in New York when hip hop was starting. And I feel like that liberation music spirit is still in hip hop and I think that's why so many indigenous people are drawn to hip hop because we don't want to be oppressed anymore and we want to take our power back. We don't want to be, you know, constantly feeling like, you know, we're less than for whatever reason and we have a story to tell. And so, you know, emceeing is one of those ways, you know, but you can also tell your story through DJing or through breaking uh, or through writing, uh, also known as graffiti. Um, like these are all, those are the four core elements of hip hop and you know these are ways that, that we can express ourselves and today I'm involved in a number of uh, youth uh, rap groups you know because our youth need to tell their story you know we got a lot of things uh, bundled up in us and I think we're ready to, to not be so oppressed I guess we're ready to, to take our power back. I shoot podcasts where we're very much trying to engage the Métis conversation. So the squeaky wheel, you can find it on every type of different listening media as well as on YouTube. And it's conversation from a Métis perspective. But one of those things that often comes forward first is the individuals I talk to say, I just don't know if I'm Métis enough. And I ask them, now I'm curious, same as you're kind of asking me, what does that mean? How does that relationship occur? And often these, these individuals will say to me, well, I haven't worn a sash. I haven't all of a sudden started to emblazon myself with it. I'm not attending the assemblies. I'm not, yeah, but the fact that you're willing to ask that question means you've started that journey. And it's different for everybody. Everybody looks at it and says, well, for me, it may be my association with the land. For others, it's strongly association with the music and the love of it. For others, it's simply the family and the gathering and how people connect within their community. But the moment you get to start with that, you start to realize that within the Métis community, you're welcomed. And you start to wear things with pride and realize there were people out there who needed or were told to hide that identity. Now, we're celebrating it. You know, to be a Métis person, it's really to um, live in a place, you know, where we are Indigenous, you know, but in the same sense, you know, we're still struggling to, to know totally who we are and even, you know, what our spirituality is, you know, a lot of us are Catholic, but, you know, and shout outs to all the, the really dope, amazing, uh, Catholics out there, but, 
you know, I also feel like a lot of us, you know, we're encouraged not to think about, you know, the land and our spirituality in, you know, more indigenous traditional ways because we were being um, kind of, I don't know how to put it, but, you know, like, um, you know, we're, it was a way of being colonized. We're, we're like, even as a two-spirit person, you know, uh, religion was a reason why we, two spirit people shouldn't have existed. You know, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, is you know what uh, some folks you know will say sort of thing. And so it's important for me to honor that I occupy this uncomfortable space, and it's not my fault. And it does come with a certain degree of power, and at the same time, um, you know that power, you know the cost of that is is a certain a bit of erasure, and so. Uh, that's not the deep meanings, you know, of the fun stuff of what being Métis means to me, but those are the things that I feel like I have to work through as a Métis person. I don't sing songs that don't give me strength. You know, the more I enjoy music, and when the crowd sees that I'm enjoying playing just as much as they're enjoying listening, that's come from the heart, and I get to experience that. But this is still a never-ending challenge. You know, you can never perfect it. And every time I learn a new song or write a new song, you know, you start to get, try and get an understanding. Where did that song come from? Where did the emotion come from? Well, when you surround yourself with good people, whether that be in business, whether that be, you know, the strength of community and the fact that somebody says, hey, we want you to come out, that makes you have to put in a little bit more effort be a little stronger, be a little better. Well, when you build that strength for yourself and you give yourself that and you accept that I accept who I am as a musician, as a husband, as a friend, as part of a family, as part of a community, and I continue to share that awareness, I'm sharing the same energy that everybody's given back to me. I bet you it's probably been about five or six years since I started emceeing, you know, or rapping at least in the closet sort of thing or in my basement. Being disconnected from my culture as a Métis, as a Native person, uh, as a Cree person, you know, I didn't really always feel like I knew how to, how to make that connection. And um, it felt like to me, that I could start to explore who I am as a native person through making uh, hip hop. Like I could be a native person on the mic sort of thing. And uh, so, and like I thought about different names, you know, but the spirit of who I wanted to be on the microphone is an MC whose words are good medicine. And so that's really where, you know, I was coming from in that and um, you know not everybody who's watching this is, is uh, native so like you know good medicine is something that we talk about in, in native culture just as you know a hug can be good medicine you know uh, smudging can be good medicine you know so coming to this place where I thought words can be good medicine you know it kind of makes us think a little bit about um, what are, how are we using the words that are coming out of our mouth? What's the impact of those words? These are just good questions, I think, to, to ask. And, you know, as a Native person speaking to my, my Native communities, you know, that really was something that I was kind of focused on. But when songs come to me, you know, I often imagine, which probably is similar to the freestyle process, but I imagine in, if, if you would, like the spirit world, you know, that there's, these songs are like things, they have a spirit themselves. And, you know, you're kind of like connecting like deep into the spirit and that spirit is coming through you in the songs you're writing, you know, the sorry, the words you're writing, you know, and oftentimes I'll, I'll be feeling a feeling and I need to, to talk about that feeling sort of thing. And so I'll start writing and uh, eventually, you know, that, will have some sort of structure to it, you know, it'll, it might have a hook or maybe, you know, uh, for those who don't know what a hook is, it's a chorus. Um, so while a lot of this, you know, it, it's important for me to honor hip hop culture, it also is a place for me to, to honor indigenous culture and my, my heritage as a Métis and as a Cree person.
when I'm songwriting, you know, my songs got to speak to somebody. You know, there's there's a kind of an impact. You know, and I think lots of times the song's speaking to me, but also trying to think through how do I write this song in a way that um, you know speaks to somebody else. And you know, when I'm freestyling, it's the same thing. When I'm when I'm speaking, you know. I'm speaking to the crowd. I'm, my job as an MC is to move the crowd. And so a lot of my process has to do with, with taking in these cultural parts of hip hop that are maybe less talked about, um, you know, getting away from hip hop just as a music genre, uh, you know, really help me to understand what I'm supposed to be doing as an MC. If we were to differentiate a rapper and an MC, a rapper is somebody who promotes themselves. An uh, MC is somebody who knows how to raise the people up. And that's, you know, we might conflate the two, but, you know, I definitely study the craft of, of MCing, but I also would identify as a rapper. Categories, yo, this is the half breed story. It's part of myself, not wrong or right, but try telling yourself that. Surrounded by lies, insecurities are opportunities to check impurities of the character of you and me. Like Locke, I used to think my complexion was a burden, but stop, I have a split mind like Tyler Durden. Why not when the world sees divide and act certain and only sees the color of the eyelid curtains? So what I look white, I don't give a F. That don't mean my cousin wasn't murdered in cold blood. That don't mean my white family don't need a hug. Separated by race, a human need to be loved. And yes, I look native, this is how it was created. And with this truth, I learned to honor the creator. And all the gifts given to me, I'm curating. I teaching as I live in the world I'm creating. Yo, they say I'm half of this and half of that. I challenge you to find a seam anywhere. In fact, your body is a place with no division of race. The conditioning that you must face. Uh, they say I'm half of this and half of that. What? I challenge you to find a seam anywhere. In fact, your body is a place with no division of race. Keep that up. I put you back in your place. Yo, this is the Metchiff story. Yeah, this is the Métis story. Yo, this is the Halfbreed story. Yeah, this the Indian story. Uh, this the Metchiff story, yeah. Yo, this the Nietzsche story. Yo, this the half-breed story. Yeah, we doing this for all of the glory. And if how I look makes you uncomfortable, you should take the energy and shove it in your mother hole. You complaining and blaming and self-detaining. Get your stuff together and know that you are lovable. I am native, I am white. Each part of myself I've hated. Each part of myself is brought to light. And while my shadow self gets right and not dated, each part of myself has shone to light. I love my whole self because that's right. I learned that stuff from the words that I write. My wholeness is never gonna come from the outside, so I gotta be my one homie on the inside. Yo, they say I'm half of this and half of that. I challenge you to find a seam anywhere. In fact, your body is a place with no division of race. That's the conditioning you must face. They say I'm half of this and half of that. What? I challenge you to find a seam anywhere. In fact, your body is a place with no division of race. Keep that up, I put you back in your place. Yo, this is the Metchiff story. Yeah, this the Métis story. Yo, this the Halfbreed story. Yeah, this the Indian story. Yo, this the Metchiff story. Yeah, this the Nietzsche story. Yo, this the Halfbreed story. Yo, we doing this for all of the glory. That was so Yay. good. Thank you. Thank you. That was amazing. And as Louis Rial had once said before they were hung for treason, when my people awake, it'll be a hundred years, but it will be the musicians and the artists who bring us all out. Now, maybe that there guitar is just one piece of that telling that story. But you know, it sure feels good when I pick that up and when you see people smiling around you, listen to music that you may have written or you're playing Metis music that, you know, gives the same energy and history and culture that I've heard so many times. Sure feels good, but this is still a journey for me. I am learning every day. Music has always been an important part of Métis culture. Music is always evolving and changing as time goes by, but the Métis people will always value a good song and celebration. Join me for our next episode in Modern Métis Canada, where we will be talking about traditional Métis dancing with Louis Prosper.